Boston Kansas State with 18 Will Howard. Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Voth, joined as always by KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway of K-State Online. You can find us over at On3 for all of your K-State coverage that you want, need, deserve. It has been one heck of a week uh, surrounding K-State athletics, and some of it very good. Basketball, what a week for both the men and women. Strong week for them, good showings all around. Uh, There was also some negativity with the men's basketball program. And we will definitely talk about that. And there was also a big, massive, glaring red flag negative for the football team that occurred uh, basically right as everybody was walking into Bramlage Coliseum. The whispers started to uh, get louder. And by the next day that everybody had woken up, forget talking about a fun overtime win over Villanova at home. It was on to freaking out about Colin Klein leaving. And little did we know that everything was going to get a lot, lot worse uh, after that moment. So... A lot of places that we can start the show and and lead things off with. Uh, Is it best to just go in, uh, I guess, in chronological order? And we can can start with football because the news of Colin Klein leaving kind of got things jump-started on Tuesday evening. I I didn't know anything about it until I got a couple of messages probably. um, I I think I had just turned on to College Avenue. Uh, in town, and I was, I was like, oh, okay, this is, uh, this is not great. But I was, I was telling dudes that were talking to me, like, no, there's no way. Like, this guy turned down Notre Dame, and the report says, hey, he also got offered Penn State and turned down. I was like, why would he want A and M? But as we found out, there's a large sum of money involved at A and M that could not be offered elsewhere. And as we have known, even though college football is progressing to a power two, essentially with the SEC and Big Ten. The SEC is still even in a class higher than what the Big Ten is. At least if you know the margin is thin, it's there. And uh, all that kind of led to this point where Colin Klein uh, decided to take the job and leave for Texas A&M. So, Drew, I will start with you. Uh, what is your reaction to K-State losing Colin Klein and how it impacts them in every which way? Yeah, I mean, the, the initial reaction, because, I mean – I think all three of us kind of were talking in Bramlage before the Villanova game about like what's different about A&M compared to the other ones. And then we still hear about the details and the money. And it, I think it truly is just kind of like the SEC lore of he can be a good coordinator at Texas A&M for a year and potentially get a, a mid tier SEC job, like a, a South Carolina or a Vanderbilt, if those jobs would become open, if he's good at if for, for one season at Texas A and M. But it, I mean, in, in the initial reaction, I mean, I I can't lie, it it felt like somebody just like kicked me in the stomach. Like a, that that's somebody that I grew up watching, and it was one of my favorite favorite players growing up was Colin Klein, and like he see, he just seemed like the person that would just be at K State and be content to wait. And then take over for Chris Climate eventually, but then that didn't end up happening. And now you turn the page and how it affects everything. And I, from the initial thing that I think everybody was most worried about was where or how does this impact Avery Johnson? And it seems like that's kind of all settled down now, and we're kind of into the waiting about potential names to come out that to fill the opening. And I think the one thing that I think is uh, the main thing, and I think it, we're all going to be in agreement about this, is that the scheme, no matter who the new offensive coordinator is, probably has to stay the same. K-State can't go backwards. It was the first time K-State really took a jump and was running a modern offense. So now no matter who the new OC is, they need to keep that up. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo, you know, I think, my first inkling was uh, seeing D.Y. start to get worried <laughs> beside me sitting on media row and showing legitimate concerns and not just uh, seeing this as a rumor, but this is a, is a possibility, if not likelihood. And then as the night, you know, we went through the game, K-State won the game. Um, so, so we got a little bit of respite. And then afterwards, it was still up in the air, kind of went home that way. Um, 
I, I checked in with DY later that night and he really didn't have any more information. And then the next morning the story comes out and it's, it's pretty much over. So I, I think probably that night the decision had been made. I don't think there was too much more decision making going on while the game was going on. While some of us thought maybe, you know, maybe there was negotiation back and forth and Klein making some, uh, some, I don't want to call them demands, but negotiating with K-State. But it, it sounds like maybe he just did that to make himself feel better, hoping K-State probably would say no. And, you know, the information we have indicates maybe K-State said a lot to yes, those, a lot of those things, and then Klein still had to take the job, which I think his mind was probably made up. So I think the opportunity to go to the SEC, get another program, I'm sure he heard some good information from Mike Elko about what his role would be and then, you know, doubling, if not tripling, his salary is, yeah. is a pretty nice thing, too. So um, I think all that comes together, and, and I, I really can't blame him. I think, I, like Drew, I was surprised at first, but then you start thinking um, there must have been a connection with Alco that he simply didn't have with Freeman last year at Notre Dame that, that probably helped this happen. And I think that's a lot of it. I think probably being in Texas rather than, then uh, and up north and, and in Indiana probably plays a factor in too because he already has some recruiting roots probably more strongly in Texas than in the Northeast. Well, and and I also think you know if this is a guy that obviously Colin Klein is smart enough to know even before he got all this attention from elsewhere that he he's pretty good at this obviously and. He's not a guy that strikes me as Brent Venable's coordinator lifer and like, do I have the temperament to be a head coach, which, you know, jury is still out on if Brent Venables has those skills to be a a successful head coach. I don't care what the record said this year, but Colin Klein seems to have it, seems to be on that trajectory. And while I think he could have become a head coach if he continued to be the offensive coordinator at K-State, the job opportunity and the size of that first head coaching job is exponentially different at Texas A&M than at K-State with the success of being the offensive coordinator, where, I mean, at K-State, it's like, yeah, he could probably get like a really good group of five job or maybe some down-in-the-dumps power five program, like, I don't know, some weird one like Syracuse or something is like, yeah, well, you know, whatever. Colin Klein is now in a position where, He's like two years away from being the next head coach at like South Carolina or something. Although I w- would probably say that they'll probably not touch another young, unproven head coach uh, if the Shane Beamer thing doesn't work out for a little bit. But that's kind of the the realm that he is in if he goes to Texas A and M and has success. And the other thing, and I've seen other people throw this out there, it probably makes some sense. Like. He's also a guy that he broadens his horizons and gains more connections by stepping out of Manhattan. The only two places he's coached in his life are K-State and Northern Iowa. There's not a lot to be gained from that, especially when you consider the continuity that K-State's had on their staff here. Until he left, there haven't been that many changes. It's Messingham got fired. The receivers coach changed every other year or less. Uh, And then, you know, Scotty Hazleton left. But outside of that, this has pretty much been the same staff since Chris Kleiman came to K-State, you know, almost five years ago now. Uh, actually, I guess exactly it's five, five years, years ago. Today. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think if, if he's a guy that wants to be a head coach, Texas A&M makes a lot of sense for that. And I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that are wondering about, like, well, what are the chances that he comes back and he's a head coach at K-State at some point? Those, I'm sure that opportunity and option will be out there. It's just going to be a matter of where both, both spots are at, at that point. Like, is Colin Klein – going to be so far above k-state by that point to where it's really not an option or is you know is k-state going to be in a spot where uh it, it doesn't make sense for them to bring colin klein on because maybe his star has uh dimmed a little so i think there's a lot there i wouldn't be surprised if it happened at some point um but for right now k-state's just going to have to go on with life without colin klein and see what comes out of that uh, fan, I'll, I'll turn to you here first. What is your confidence level in K-State being able to figure this thing out without Colin Klein running the offense? Because I'm sure everybody's worried about going backwards in time to the Courtney Messingham offense or whatever else, especially you know if Connor Riley ends up being the guy. Uh, what What is the fix and the expectation for K-State moving forward on offense? 
Well, I think, you know, ideally, at this point, we're looking to maintain what we had because we went from a top 25 <clears throat> offense in the F-plus ranking to last year to a top 15 offense this year. So basically top 20 both seasons, uh, top 20-ish in points per drive, um, top 20-ish in available yardage rate. So uh, some of those advanced stats that I like to follow, you know, it's not likely we're going to get better. I mean, you never know with Avery Johnson, a talent like that, maybe we could. But um, the expectation probably should be we have a top 20 offense. We want to keep it. Um, looking at the next step, um, unless – you can go hire a surefire play caller that has play calling experience in a top 30 offense. Um, I don't mind keeping Riley around as the primary play caller. He's been around multiple uh, different offenses, mainly Colin Klein and Messingham, but some others at North Dakota State as well. Um, one of K-State's biggest strengths is a, is a pretty diverse running game that uses both the gap and zone schemes, which is pretty hard to do, um, but they do it really well and they can kind of switch back and forth really well. And obviously Connor Riley is probably a big part of that as the offensive line coach and as the run game coordinator the last couple of years. So, so what I'd like to see, unless you can go find that play caller that has experience, if you keep Riley, um, it would be nice to add some new blood from some, someone that climb and trust. Cause I think he's, I think Elko, from what we've heard, Klein is going to pretty much be the offensive head coach. I don't think Kleiman runs it that way. I think Kleiman is going to have a little more say. Um, but if you can go get someone from a more creative passing game uh, that does some different things that maybe we haven't done under Colin Klein, I think that would be ideal to bring in to, to coordinate with uh, um, Coach Riley. Now, that becomes tougher is because – Riley has been the offensive line coach. I don't. I think it'd be tough to be the offensive line coach and an offensive coordinator. So it's more than likely he's going to have to move to a role like maybe tight ends or something, and then you move up another offensive line coach. But then what do you do to find that passing game coordinator type to fill in that role, which I think gives K-State the highest ceiling um, if you don't have an experienced play caller on the staff, which I don't think probably is going to be the case with the money we're going to have available. So – that, that's my take on it. We'll see what happens. I'm not against letting Riley get a shot, but uh, I do think it'd be nice to bring in some new blood as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I echo that exact sentiment. Like, that needs to be... I, what I would kind of like to see, because I, I feel like at this point, just with what k has money-wise and the job coming in, you're probably not going to get a guy that has a ton of experience calling plays. So I wouldn't mind having like Connor Riley and then you bring in new blood as like a co-offensive coordinator and one of them calls the plays and you kind of figure that out and you just get a good quarterback slash passing game coach to kind of go along with all of this. So, I, I mean, my confidence is pretty high. I mean, I think ever since uh, the Messingham firing, we've kind of seen uh, Coach Kleiman really branch out and kind of go for guys that weren't really on our radar about – uh, for new hires, like I don't think anybody really thought that uh, Matthew Middleton was really on a radar or Thad Ward was on a radar at that point. So we're seeing him kind of grow and kind of go outside the box and do things that like we didn't expect. I mean, I, I don't think that we expected the transition to a spread offense when Colin Klein initially took over. I thought we thought that it would kind of look more kind of like a Bill Snyder offense and it ended up being just spread it out so i mean it's not it wouldn't be surprising if we saw connor riley if he were to take the job keep the offense mostly the same scheme wise well here i'll i'll, I'll ask this of you drew obviously a big part about what k-state is is doing and trying to navigate this transition is make sure that it's the right situation and scenario for avery johnson to want to stay at k-state look they got a a head start on good news this past week with the number video and everything and like still going through bowl practice. Avery Johnson's going to play in K-State's bowl game. I feel pretty good in saying that. There are still a couple of days after that bowl game, though, where the transfer portal is open. And I maybe I'm just too much of a pessimist, but 
I am not going to celebrate and pop the confetti until the portal has closed and Avery Johnson is still on K-State's roster because there are a lot of things that they have to navigate and get correctly here. What is the move? Because you need a quarterback's coach. So how would you handle this situation and going out and finding a guy you know, even if there's somebody on staff, they say, okay, you're the quarterback's coach, but you still got to find somebody that jives and helps Avery Johnson, I think, coming in to make this offense be what he needs and wants it to be. How, how would you handle this situation? Because, like, the way I see it, I, I would have walked in and just said, you know, the day, the day you find out you're losing Colin Klein, I would have said, all right, you tell me who you, tell me who you like, and uh, I'm going to cater to you. Because I uh, my initial thought when they lost Colin, I said, I don't know who it is, but go find me whoever his personal quarterbacks coach is because they all have them and just say, all right, you're the guy now. Because I can't imagine a, a personal quarterback coach is making as much money as w- you could as a singular coach in a Power 5 program. No, like I was literally about to say the exact same thing. Like I, I feel like this is a lot of power for a 19-year-old, but I would give him like, hey, who do you want? Like this is your program right now. You're the guy. Who would you like? But – in, in that same sense, though, you kind of think about it. And if you don't include him, which you don't really have to, but you'd think that this job would be a lot more attractive for a quarterback's coach because of who is there. Because you can be like, hey, look at what we have. Like, this is going to be our new starting quarterback starting next season. And, and that's kind of where I think that you can throw the co-offensive coordinator job out at a quarterback's coach as well. Yeah, I think that's true. And the other thing to look at is is Kleiman's had a, you know, pretty good track record in hiding, hiring coordinators. Um, Hazelton was a pretty good hire. Replaced him with Klanderman, who's been a pretty good hire. Messingham, I understood because he's been with him, and you know, he was I think better than a lot of people get him credit for. But and when it came push came to shove. Kleiman was willing to move on from someone he knew personally for years and years and, and then made a really good hire and, and Colin Klein. So, um, you know, besides Messingham and, and Messingham wasn't as absolutely terrible as, as some make him out to be, although he, he was, I think replaced when he needed to be um, the track record with, with coordinators has been pretty good. So that gives me hope that this decision will be a good one as well. That, that doesn't hurt. Messingham's highs were high, but his lows, man, they were they were low. That's true. That's that's fair. He was really good against Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah, and really crap against Texas. Yes. Uh, so yeah, he got he got one half of Red River right. He just the other <laughs> half he couldn't figure it out, and that's what did him in. Uh, look, I, I I I said it throughout the week, and and when it was going on, I can stomach K State losing Colin Klein as long as you can hang on to Avery Johnson um, because that's going to attract good candidates. You're going to be able to mask even some mistakes uh, that could go on uh, if you have a, a not a great coordinator but an okay one. Avery Johnson is going to make a lot of good guys look great. Um, same goes for the guys that are on the field with him. He's going to make average dudes look really good. And so I, I think that's an opportunity that's there, but we'll just have to kind of wait and see. Uh, we have 18 days until the Pop-Tarts Bowl with K-State and NC State. Look, there's really not much to share that's going on here. Obviously, the portal has popped off. Uh, I look at it, n- not a ton of major losses in terms of, like, you know, did, did K-State want to keep this guy or what was going on here? Um, obviously, the names that stand out to people, Treshawn Ward and Will Lee. Will Lee already committed to Texas A&M. Um, well, I'll, I'll let Drew just go here real quick on the losses that K State has sustained ahead of the bowl game. Uh, which ones are the most impactful, if any of them? And also uh, some guys that we know aren't going to be playing in the game because they've just opted to go ahead uh, with their their pro career and, and try and get that jump start, like Philip Brooks. Which I, explain the Philip Brooks one to me. Explain that one to me because I don't really see. And I mean, I'm not trying to be mean here. I'm just being honest. I, I don't see a professional football career for Philip Brooks unless we're talking about the Canadian Football League. Uh, wh- what what is what's the deal there? Is that just something where maybe there was also a hint of like, hey, Avery's already playing quarterback. 
we're just going to infuse a bunch of young guys in this game. Your opportunity might be lesser than what you're expecting, or is this truly Philip Brooks is trying to give a, a jump start to a professional career that I just don't see happening? Uh, so for portal losses that are kind of uh, impactful, I, I think we're, we're all kind of in, in agreement that Will Lee is probably the, the biggest loss I mean, because he, he had two years of eligibility, uh, eligibility left, was pretty good for most of the year. The Iowa State game still just kind of stands out for the attempt of a tackle. And, and then you kind of wonder about how really bought into the Iowa State game he really was if he was willing to transfer right away. But he's probably the, the biggest loss in the portal so far because you look down the list and it's either guys that were only had really their COVID year left or they were a non-contributor, non-starter. So you don't really, you're not losing a ton. Like Nate Matlack is another one that's pretty notable, but it's kind of, it's more of like a scheme thing where he, this, the three, three, five just wasn't for him. Like it is for some of the younger defensive ends that are coming up. Uh, the Philip Brooks opt out situation is uh, kind of bizarre to me uh, to go through and play. I think, he's going to play like 64 career games and this is the one that he's not. <laughs> but I mean, it, you could say that it might be just them starting a youth movement. Um, so I, it could just be something along those lines where especially a receiver, they have a, a bunch of freshmen that they really like. So maybe we see just a, a ton of freshmen play in the bowl game and use us as a jump start for next year. Okay. I just, and I don't know. I, I, some of those are, are kind of odd. And again, like I think Trayshawn Ward's probably the loss to me that I look at and say like, out of all these guys, I probably would have liked to have had him back next year the most. Um, just because like, we don't really know what to expect behind DJ Giddens, but it's not like a massive loss because you have DJ Giddens. So I'm not, I'm not just going to overreact to, to really anything. Uh, the staff also really the likes Joe Jackson too. So you you hope that he takes a step in the spring. Well, and and he takes a step now. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. Some of these guys, uh, if you if you want to have something that resembles a football game, you should probably step up now based on uh, what's coming your way. All right. Let's move on, dive into basketball. I'm sure that's what everybody is most looking forward to. Hey, it was a pretty good week on the floor for K-State basketball. They win their first Big 12 Big East battle game ever in overtime over Villanova, and then they go on the road yesterday and they take care of LSU. They lead by double digits for a majority of the game. They let it slip a little bit there, but they rebounded, looked good in doing it. Uh, I'll start with Fan here. He is the, the hoops guru. Uh, what did you make of this week of basketball for K-State, not considering the off-the-court stuff because we will get into that momentarily, but just purely from an on-court perspective, uh, what should we know about K-State this week? Well, I think you had, you know, anytime you have a week where you win two Power Six games in the non-conference, um, I think you're going to be happy with that. Um, Villanova's, you know, is number 30 in Ken Palm, number 51 in the net, so that's a very solid win. Um, more than likely, um, a team that's that's probably going to move up in the net ranking in Big East play if they play well. So, a really good shot to become a quad one win, quad two win at the at the worst. Uh, I think Providence is probably in that same ballpark as well. Um, LSU, I don't know how good they're going to be um, if if they get their uh, suspended player back, uh, Collins or Cook. What I can't remember his name. Cook. He, yeah. Cook, they could be. I mean, he's a factor because they really don't have very, they don't have great guard play. Um, so, so regardless, you go on the road for your first time and you win. Um, you do give up a run. You're always, you're almost always going to give up a run. I said on Twitter X during the game that I, I thought a run was going to come at some point. I hoped, I didn't think it was going to be sixteen to two, but I thought a run was going to come. But then you, you got to credit K State for responding. You know, they cut it. LSU cuts it to three, and K State immediately gets it back up to seven. Then it's an eight point game at the under four, right after the under four timeout. K State closes out on a ten to three run on the road to win that game. Something they didn't do against Villanova. They had the ball with plenty of chances to put that game away in the final four minutes and not go to overtime. But 
but then you get to overtime and they go on the run and they put that game away. So really good uh, opportunities in both games to, to really play well and win. Um, we're seeing um, kind of the rise of Arthur Kaluma as, as a legitimate conference honors type player with the way he's playing lately, I think. You have Cam Carter in that ballpark. We haven't quite seen that from Tyler Perry yet. Although he's still, even though he's struggling to shoot it, he's still the most efficient player on the team if you look at offensive rating. So um, you've got three really good players. Um, and, and, you know, it almost seemed to me a little bit of the LSU game, you know, I think there was apprehension that the week would be a distraction. But I also think there's clarity for the players. There's clarity that yeah. at least we know what's going on now. We know that that – Tomlin's not going to be back. We're just waiting on Quez, Quez Glover to be a part of this team, and let's go out and play basketball. That's what it looked like for, for me, which was a relief because it could have gone the other way. It really could have gone the other way. And to see that team respond um, was really nice to see. But, th- you know, that's that's a great week of basketball. I I can't remember very many weeks where K-State has won two power six out-of-conference games in the same week in the same non-conference. I think that's – probably something that hasn't happened very often in the last 30 years. Yeah, especially when they're not considering like an MTE or something where you yeah. you play a bunch of them or you go like two and one or something. Like these are games that were on the schedule and you went out, won them. And look, I at the end of the day, I don't think either of these teams, Villanova and LSU, end up being all that good. Maybe Villanova has a chance, but I'm I'm not on them like some. I think a lot of people it's – Oh, it's Villanova. It's the name recognition. This is not the same Villanova team. Kyle Neptune's going to be fired by the end of the season. Like, I, I just I, I don't think you know whatever. But you still had to go out and win that game. Villanova still has some legit players, and so much about the non-conference at this point, and really throughout the entirety of basketball is just survive it, get to conference play, and then go from there. I mean, that's what last year's team did. Now they they were able to handle some teams a little bit easier, but they had the loss to Butler and they played some weaker competition and they didn't look great. And, you know, we didn't know what to expect and they didn't take off until their second conference game. And then they turned into the team that we know them to be. So I think, you know, it was a good week last week for K-State. Arthur Kaluma is obviously a big deal. Drew and I talked about it a little bit yesterday after, but I think, uh, since the the tournament in the Bahamas, he's averaging like 19 points a game, and he's just playing good. And I think he's the kind of guy that there needs to be a bigger emphasis in making sure that you repeatedly get him the ball and let him have the opportunity to make plays. I think that's one of the issues that came up in the Villanova game. And the guy had 20 in the first half, and maybe Villanova did a better job of preventing him from even getting the ball, but I, I felt like they could have forced it to him a little bit more because the touches just didn't seem to be there in the second half of that game. But he came through. I'd call it a quiet 17 uh, that he had against LSU because so many other guys were making plays and coming through. So a good week for K-State. And being able to win that game by double digits yesterday impressed me because, I, as I said yesterday to Drew, I wasn't going to punish this team with my thoughts if they had lost that game. There were a million legitimate reasons why if they lost that game, I would have given them a pass, um, but they they came through and they played, I mean, may, maybe a better game than they played against Villanova uh, to win yesterday in Baton Rouge. Yeah, Mason, you call it a, a quiet 17 from Arthur Kluma. I call it an efficient 17. He took eight shots. A Dean Wade 17. <laughs> like, he, he he's turning into the guy that we kind of thought that he would be when he transferred in from Creighton that we were kind of, I don't want to say promised, but the guy that we kind of expected him to be uh, a more consistent scorer, rebounder. Uh, I wrote after the Villanova game that I think that his defense has really taken a jump as well. And he's a lot more engaged on the defensive end. Uh, I mean, look, I mean, you guys have already said it's a good week. I mean, before the season starts, you, you I tell you, Naquan Tylen was isn't going to play a game this year. Quez Glover isn't going to play a game at this point. Dayday Ames is going to miss a game. Arthur Kluma is going to be told that he needs to buy in and and not play a game. 
and uh, Will McNair is going to be suspended for a game. What 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 do I, what do you guys think that the record would be? <laughs> I mean, not good, not great. Yeah, and, and they're eight and two. So I mean, yeah, you, you you look down and they just keep winning. I mean, I saw today that they jumped in the net ranking twenty six spots from last yeah. night to this morning. So it, it's going to continually get better. And I mean, well, I assume that we'll kind of get into this, but Nebraska and Wichita State aren't very good. Oh, yeah. Boy, I cannot wait. Uh, whew, I cannot wait to talk about the Shockers. Uh, real quick, another guy that you talked about, you know, maybe the the Kaluma that we were kind of promised or he was built up to be. Um, another guy that the flashes have been there this year and the highs are higher than what they were last year. The lows are still just as low as they were, and he can really disappear fast as Cam Carter, who came out and had a really strong start to the game yesterday. And then, oh, I don't, I'm, did he hit a shot from the floor in the second half, or he maybe got one, but it was a struggle there. Uh, and he had, you know, 17 or 19 instantly, and then only two more points the rest of the way. Uh, where do we stand with Cam Carter? Because he has obviously gotten better over the offseason. And he's showing signs of of being a a good player, but he still has the issue of consistency, which was my biggest gripe with him last year. Was yes, he can go out there and the overall numbers looked okay and like a good number four option on a team last season. But if you really dig in and you watch a game, you go, Cam Carter is not one of the four best players that K State has, and he's darn near a liability at times. Like he was not a good player last year, but this year. He is a good player, just the, the consistency is is missing. What what should we know about Cam Carter? What are your guys' thoughts on uh, the start to the season that Cam has had? I, I agree with you that the uh, the weird half-by-half half splits we have with Cam Carter first and second <laughs> bad, and then Tyler Perry bad first and second half has been better is weird. Um but Cam has made, you know, you're, you're right. He, he, he was a 0.9 offensive efficiency player last year. Right now he's a 1.08. That's a big jump, especially when you consider he's jumped 8% in his usage from 15% to 23%. And he's jumped uh, 12% almost in his shot rate. He, he shot 17% of the shots when he was on the floor last year. This year he's shooting 28% of the shots when he's on the floor. He's, he's our highest usage player on the court. And to make that jump and then to, to, to jump in usage and shot rate and then also jump in efficiency is a pretty good sign of a player that's, that's legit. Now, you know, you could, you could say some of it's a schedule, but we've played a much tougher schedule. Even though we haven't played a bunch of top 20 teams, we're playing way more top 100, top 70 teams in, in both the net and both uh, Ken Palm than we did last year. Uh, legitimate power five, power six teams, and then a couple of decent mid majors. Um, so, so I think you can say that that um, there's some legitimate hope that this is a, a, a true number two, number three option on this team, um, and a guy that can be a consistent double digit scorer. Um, he can go get some rebounds. Um, he can make some threes. Um, he can get some assists as well. He's not a point guard. He's a combo guard that can also distribute um, a scoring guard that can also distribute. So I see a lot of good signs on, on what we're seeing from him. I'd like to see him shoot a better from three. I think right now that was my biggest problem. Uh, second would be quit shooting long twos because he's <laughs> not very good at them and he shoots a lot of them. We can get into that a little bit. Him and him and Kaluma both. I mean, quit shooting two-point jump shots. Those two are like 22% from two <laughs> combined on two-point jumpers, not at the rim. Um, and I, in my opinion, the worst shot in basketball. So, so, and, and a lot of times they're fadeaways from 15 feet, <laughs> yeah. guarded, off balance. It's like, guys, quit shooting those shots. And the ones that do go in for Kaluma, they like just <laughs> yes. barely go over the rim. And like it, it doesn't touch anything, but it's because it was razor thin <laughs> between hitting the rim or not. Uh, so they yeah. they almost look like air balls the way they go through. That's how just tight they are going in. Yeah. But yeah, but, but Cam's a Cam's a good player. I like he's still got he's still got more proven in him this season, I think. But so far, 
this is one of the more impressive improvements for a player that I've seen in quite a while. Yeah, I, I still go back to what I said yesterday. Like, I, I think Cam is probably the biggest beneficiary when Quez Glover comes back because not only will he have the ball a little bit less, but it gives him time to sit on the bench and he doesn't have to exude so much energy because I think what we're seeing in the second half is him just working so hard defensively because he guards the other team's best player every game that his shots are just short in the second half because he's so tired, which I mean, if you look at his game log, it is hilarious because of the uh, amount of overtime games. Like he's almost averaging over 40 minutes a game. <laughs> that's uh, that's, that's pretty impressive for Cam Carter. Look, I, I, what you're saying there, Drew, I think part of Cam Carter's problem is you know, obviously he does expand, you know, expend a lot of energy out on the floor because he's guarding the toughest defender. I think he's just like an antsy and energetic dude by nature. Like in the non on court playing stuff, I think we can see that with him with the like any of the videos that the social team puts out, him after the wins against like Villanova or whoever. I think he's just a dude that has a lot of energy and. It's almost like they, they need to find a way to like get that to just tone down a little bit. It probably helps him on the defensive end, but uh, there probably need to be a few moments. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if Jerome Tang ever has to like in the middle of a practice just be like, Cam, chill out, like relax. <laughs> you know, like I, I think we've all been around guys that are like that, and you need that authority figure to be just like, hey, like you're not in trouble or anything, but like relax for a second. Like it's all good. So I think that there is probably a little bit of that to, uh, Cam Carter, and that probably leads to getting a lot of shots up at different times, being a little quick with your decision making, like you know, just settling for uh, a, a deep two or something along those lines. My wife and daughter just scared the heck out of me, just <laughs> stalking me in the door over here. I, I I jumped like I had no idea what was going on. Um, so I I think that honestly, like I've been impressed with Cam. I was really critical last year. And I, I've got to give him his props for what he's become because he's a valuable part of K-State's team right now. And I hold out hope that he can even take another little step within the season to where it's more consistent, it's more efficient, and we're talking about Cam being this team's true second-best player come the end of the year. Uh, because based off of skill set and what they've shown this year, behind Arthur Kaluma, I think that he probably presents – the greatest number two option for K-State. If K-State is going to be their best, I think it has to be with Cam Carter as the number two because I just don't know that Tyler Perry's skill set is going to put them in that position right now. Yeah, and I, and I think Cam is number two and Kalum is number one raises the ceiling for Tyler Perry. Yes. To, to get the best matchups and to get the best opportunities to get open shots. Because is, Tuesday night really against winning. Villanova – their yeah. number one focus coming out of the gates was yeah. making sure that he did not touch the ball. And if he did, there were two guys on him when it was happening. And obviously when he is, you know, as small as he is, you get two guys on you. It's really tough to go and find something where you have some room to, to make anything happen. So it makes a lot of sense uh, in terms of on court stuff, moving forward, this is a really good kind of relaxation period for K-State. They don't play for another week. Their next game is December 17th, Sunday afternoon against Nebraska. Uh, shout out to Nebraska ball. They are exposing the fraud that uh, some affectionately call Mr. March right now. Uh, they look on their way to beating Michigan State in Lincoln tonight. Uh, as we go, there's 30 seconds left. They're up six. Michigan State's having to foul. Mr. March is about to be four and five, so – I guess that's not, you know, that's why they don't call him Mr. November and Mr. December. Um, he takes those off and we still act like, you know, congrats on winning a national title 23 years ago. Um, but whatever. Uh, so Nebraska, I don't think they're great. They obviously have some bad looking losses. They lost by 30 to Creighton. They lost by double digits on the road at Minnesota earlier this week, but there is something to them. We saw some fight from them last season in T-Mobile center. Um, what do you expect when K-State faces Nebraska and where that should go? Because I think right now uh, Ken Palm has K-State as like a six-point winner uh, in that projection. So where where do you guys have your expectations set for that game? Well, N Nebraska's – we're finally seeing kind of a Hoiberg-type team, which we really hasn't 
had yet at Nebraska. Pretty good offensive team. Um, not a great three-point shooting team, but a good two-point shooting team and uh, top 50 in, a, in Ken Palm offensive efficiency uh, outside the top 100 in, in defensive efficiency. So um, they've got some good players. Um, Bryce Williams, double-digit di- score. Rink Mast, double-digit score. Um, Tom Aninga, we've seen him. He's been around. He's really the only one that's been around uh, in the two games K-State has played the last couple of years against Nebraska. So. A uh, little bit of a new team, um, but, you know, Hoiberg's can, he, I'll give Hoiberg credit. Number one, he scheduled some real puds to start the season so he could get off to a 7-0 start um, with his best win in that time being Duquesne. Then he meets Creighton, Minnesota, and loses. This would be, you know, this even though Michigan State is probably the most disappointing team in the country from number four uh, in the first AP poll to four and five, as you said, four and six, <laughs> Um, um, pretty big drop for Mr. March. Uh, yeah. Definitely not Mr. November, December. So um, that's a good win for them. They're going to have a little bit of confidence there because I think they've got the whole week off as well um, before they face us during finals week. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that should be a fun matchup. And then you get Wichita State who just lost to uh, the South Dakota State team that K-State destroyed. So yeah. Um, uh, we'll see what happens, but again, I think Nebraska will be it'll be a game. K State should win. There's no doubt. You got them on your home floor. You should beat them. Uh, but they they do present more of a challenge than maybe we would expect. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's safe to say that they're getting better. But this is a team that K State should still. I don't want to say handle, but they <laughs> they should probably win and be in control for most of the game. Yeah, this this is an arm's length game where yeah. you go in K State. You would hope that in the first ten minutes they have a pretty good run that punches Nebraska, and the rest of the game K State leads by you know no less <laughs> than like six or seven points. And maybe you'll have some moments where it's like, well, you know, it could get uncomfortable here, but ultimately K State never gives in, uh, which I think would be kind of a good goal for this game because we have seen in these these games, no matter who the competition level is, they have the, the nature to just kind of, I don't know if they think they've got it in the bag or just lack a stretch of energy, but they will give uh, quite a bit to let the other team get back in it. As we saw with Villanova and LSU this week, where double digit leads shrunk down rather quickly and you were having to scramble. And obviously the Villanova game, they got in a position where they had to make something happen in overtime, but, uh, I, I expect this to be a, a fine test for K-State, similar to last year with Nebraska, mm-hmm. where it was uh, the, the right test at the right time in a game that you should win, but it's not going to come easy. And I think those games against the right type of teams are beneficial to you. I don't want people to think that I'm saying that that game against North Alabama was beneficial because in no way was it. <laughs> uh, that was still a bad game. <laughs> North Alabama sucks, and they will continue to suck. So that was not a good game. But if you play, you know, Nebraska who can hang around a little bit, maybe test you some, uh, it's not it's not a, a major deal as long as you come out with the win, which I expect. And then we'll talk about it more uh, next week. But, yes, Wichita State is on the docket after that. That's uh, Thursday the 21st in Kansas City at the T-Mobile Center. I, everybody knows it. That is my Super Bowl of K-State sports. <laughs> um <laughs> I, I like telling people I don't think they understand it, but you know, I last year, December third, I just got done watching my school win a Big Twelve title in person in overtime against the number three team. It was awesome. Like I should be enjoying it. And here I am in a hotel room sweating out this ugly game with Wichita State because there is nothing I want more in life than K State to put Wichita State and their uppity little fans in their place because they are not a power school. They are not a basketball school. They're just a school that has basketball and far to their way to one Final Four. And, yes, congratulations on a strong three years. That strong three years ended up without Coach being fired in disgrace, and now you're struggling. And you barely put 4,000 fans in a 15,000-seat downtown arena last night. 27% capacity to watch you lose by 10 points to a dog crap South Dakota State team that K-State dog walked in Bramlage Coliseum earlier this year. 
K-State needs to take care of business and win that game by 20 points. Not only because it would be good for the program, because it would be good for my sanity and all the shit that I have talked for the last 25 years of my life, and I will continue to talk for the next 25 years of my life. So, to the Wichita State Shocker seeing this, you can get pissed <laughs> off at me like all the NC State fans at us, but you are worthless, you are nothing, your team is a bunch of scrubs, you're lousy fans, and K-State is going to put you back in your low major place come Thursday, December 21st in Kansas City, Missouri. So sit down, shut up, and let the big boys at K-State and KU smack you around at the end of December. Enjoy your Christmas. Happy holidays, you big fat losers. So, all right. You guys now, want to talk about Ma- Wichita State at all? Ma- Mason, I, I will. I will just add. I don't. I don't hate them as much as you do, but I don't like them at all. And <laughs> it, it kind of goes back to um, this is back in the Wooly days. There was a couple of Wichita State fans that would show up on a message board called KSU KSU fans, and they were obnoxious. Um, it was the Mark Turgeon era, and so it it was not fun. Um, and I've never liked him ever since then, based on just a couple of message board fans. I've not liked him at all. You know, we have won four straight against the Shockers. I do expect it to be five straight this year. Uh, it's fun to beat them. Um, I do think, you know, I, there was a point where I thought, okay, let's play them because they're decent. Let's let's play it in state school. I'd rather do that than play some scrub by game. Yeah. Now I we're I think we're back on the other side of the mountain. We're like. It's not worth playing these guys anymore. They're no. not very good. They're yeah. obnoxious. Like you say, what a bunch of front runner fans. You got four thousand fans at that arena. And they talked about three or four years ago when they were at the end of Greg with two G's. Um, three G's. <laughs> yeah, three G. And and thinking they were so great and thinking they had the best fans in the state. And now they can't even show up because they don't support a team when it really matters, when you're not very good. So are they gonna um, win a game this month? Saturday's the best chance. Oh, that's a, that's a good question. Yeah. Look, uh, I, I will say this, believe it or not. Um, I actually, I know people inside the Wichita state athletic department for my two years doing radio down here. I don't dislike them. I, I really like <laughs> Brent Kimnitz. He is an awesome guy, former pitching coach at Wichita state. Now does a bunch of their fun. Like he is an awesome dude and everything. A lot of respect for them, but this is purely based on their fans. And I explained this to a lot of people like, I don't expect you guys to feel the way I do about Wichita state because you're not from less than an hour from Wichita Mm -hmm. dealt with a lot more Wichita state fans. Obviously I was in high school when they went to their final four. So it was like peak obnoxiousness, not only from their fans, but also you're the most obnoxious person in the world when you are a sports fan in high school, because you're of an age where you feel like you're grown enough to like, let your voice be heard, but you don't, you're not really like smart enough in the head to like piece everything together yet. And so it just drives you insane. Being around that, I'm just like, this is, this is bogus. You guys are not better than K-State. And the worst thing to happen was them beating KU in the NCAA tournament. I mean, that, (laughs) That might be the worst loss of my life, and it doesn't even have to do with – like it was just – that was mental torture for me to, to go through that. Uh, so, yes, I, I, I do not like them. They are very obnoxious. I like seeing bad things happen to Wichita State. That is why this past weekend, very funny to see that happen. I, I was about to just be a good guy. I was like, you know, I've – I was I've, about so, to be I've a good put guy. money on both Kansas schools to win today. They did. Maybe I should just keep the train rolling, and I'm lucky that I did not do it because they laid an egg against South Dakota State. Um, so. so their their fans were just furious about that one loss to uh, Missouri, like <laughs> four thousand yeah. fans after a loss to Missouri. Yeah, I, I just I don't know how you how you do that down there. I mean, four thousand. Uh, K State they played they played Tulsa and Colorado State at Intrust, and those were not great. I mean, they lost that game to Tulsa in Intrust. Um, Never that was schedule Tulsa fun. again. Yeah, keep Tulsa off the schedule. Um, so, I don't know. Like, that's that's one of those that's weird. All right, let's 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 move on before I dive into more of that. We can talk Wichita State next week. I'm sure people are going to be upset about how I handled it, whatever. I don't really care. Also, like, if you can't tell that 
only 75% of that is how I actually feel. And 25% of that is me cutting a WWE style promo for Mitch Fortner out there, then I can't help you. Um, so we'll, we'll move on and uh, talk about stuff a lot less fun than hating on Wichita state. The negative news this week was big time and overshadowing some supportive and big time wins for K state basketball. And the fact that, I mean, we, we should be talking more about how just kick butt the women's basketball team has been. They went, up to St. Joe and throttled Missouri yesterday. Um, at least, you know, one team in the state of Kansas could cover against Missouri yesterday. Rough day um, to be a Missouri fan. Yeah. Oh, boy. I I can't imagine how you're feeling after that. Um, but obviously, we know that Wednesday, the news comes out at 640 at night that Naquan Tomlin has been kicked off the basketball team. And we know behind the scenes – that all indications say Gene Taylor and Jerome Tang were at least fighting for that to not be the outcome. At the very least, we can say that. It seems like they were in support of, hey, this guy has done what the law has told him he's needed to do and what we feel like he has needed to do. He's now sat out, you know, after that situation, because, you know, the K-State played a game just this weekend, but he had sat out nine games and, Seemed like, okay, things are moving in a direction. There had been rumors that, hey, the the, the staff had been told, all right, you're going to have a decision on this day, a decision on this day. And what ends up happening Tuesday night, there is a we want Naquan Tomlin chant that gets rather loud uh, inside of Bramlage in the middle of the game for K-State where, like, they're up and it's it's still tense and everything. There are signs that get quickly flashed off the Jumbotron talking about freeing Naquan. And then there's a protest that takes place outside of the president's residence on campus on Wednesday. And lo and behold, Gene Taylor has to put out a statement in his name saying that Naquan Tomlin can no longer continue with the men's basketball team at K-State. And it sent everything into disarray because we were told that that is going to be the only comment that K-State Athletics has on the matter. Well, then Jerome Tang had to put out a video on Thursday that really he got the angry mob off of Richard Linton's back because everybody's vitriol had rightly been turned towards the president of K-State because he did not handle this in an appropriate manner at all. He, he botched this thing from the get-go. And then what does the president turn around and do? After Jerome Tang, the number one unifier and probably the most important person at your school right now in terms of what he can do on the court – and just the way he brings everybody together and the notoriety that he has brought to Kansas State, he has cooled everything off. I think everybody, they still would have been upset about Richard Linton, but they would have stopped with the social media, all the other public stuff. It was done. People had moved on like, you're, you know what? Coach Tang is right. Let's take a step back. Just chill. We'll be fine. And then Richard Linton just got the fire poker and said, let's get this baby going again. I, I can't be left out in the dust here. He puts out a statement that, Again, it's, an, it's the third statement from K-State on the matter after they said they would only have one. And there's a, just, it's a word salad. A lot of things in there saying, you know, we can't talk about it, what it is, but also the NCAA says we have to follow these rules. Just a master class in just foolishness by K-State and their president right now. And it's, it's brought a very dark cloud over K-State, which already was going through a lot with people realizing that Colin Klein was leaving for Texas A&M. So, Look, here's, here's the deal on this. I do not have the adequate information to decide if Richard Linton made the right decision in kicking Naquan Tomlin off the team. Um, I, don't, I don't have that. But what I do know is that he did it in a totally wrong way if he was warranted in kicking him off the team. And every step of the way, he has mishandled this situation from the fact that, okay, it's, it's odd that you're kicking him off now after public heat has been turned up because he returned to the team two weeks ago. The legal situation has seemingly been cleared up. He's on diversion. He's going to get that taken care of. Everything seems to be going in a normal manner. Nothing has seemingly changed, but somehow less than 24 hours after students are chanting, we want Naquan, there are signs, there's a protest. He's all of a sudden off the team. And then a guy that we know – was not in support of this decision and Gene Taylor has to put out a statement in his name 
saying that Naquan Tomlin can no longer continue, put your name on it if you're Richard Linton. And that's been my thing from the get-go. And if you feel like Naquan Tomlin can't be a member of this basketball team, I don't care that Naquan Tomlin was graduating on Saturday, then step up and have the stones to kick him out of school. Because if he can't be on the basketball team at K-State, then he shouldn't be a student at K-State. But Richard Linton wasn't going to have the repercussions come to his doorstep. He was going to push it on Jerome Tang and Gene Taylor, as he's continuously done in this process since the suspension began. And Jerome Tang continued to have to say, no new update, no new update. He had to eat every bullet on the Naquan Tomlin situation because – he was kind of handcuffed in what he could and couldn't do. And that's why this is just a failure in leadership by Richard Linton. And it's put K-State as a school, as an athletic program, in a really bad spot. It's going to be very tense for a long time to come. And I don't know that Richard Linton's ever going to be able to earn the trust back of the K-State community after the way this, this whole thing played out. Uh, and I'm not sure that he deserves to get it back based on how it's gone down. So it's going to be fascinating to see if he shows his face next Sunday against Nebraska um, because, I mean, it's not going to go over well when, it, when he is there. But you're the president. You made these decisions. Step up. Put your name on it. Take the heat that you rightly deserve in this situation and hope in a lot of ways that you can make this right with Jerome Tang and Gene Taylor and anybody else that you've wronged during this period of time. And, again, I will end it by reiterating – I don't, and I don't think a lot of people outside of those that are actually in the program and directly communicate with Naquan Tomlin and the authorities and whoever else, I don't think that anybody has the actual full amount of information to make the decision in their head. Should Naquan Tomlin still have been on the team or should he have not have been? That's not the issue that everybody's upset about. It's the way that everything else has been handled. Because if you're going to kick him off the team, do it two weeks ago. Why, why did he get to come back to practice and be with the team on the bench? All these things, like what has changed here? So th this is just a, a massive failure in a lot of ways for, for K-State as a school and who they have leading them right now. And look, I, I'm sure deep down in his heart, Richard Linton probably thought he was doing the right thing. But at the very least, if we're going to give him any benefit of doubt, he needs to fire whoever's advising him and find some new people because they royally screwed this up this weekend and not in a royal purple way. They just royally screwed it up. So uh, I'll, I'll give the floor to Drew and Fan here. And uh, Fan, I'll let you go first. You're the, you're the wiser man of this group, and you're probably less emotional about it than we are. But uh, I'll let you take over and give your thoughts on the situation. Well, you got to kind of go by what we know. I think, you know, you, you mentioned we don't know exactly what happened um, to have all the information, but we do know Naquan, Naquan Tomlin was suspended in October when, when that information came out. Um, but we also know the day before Thanksgiving, he was on the bench again for Central Arkansas. We know that a few days later uh, against Oral Roberts, who's on the bench. We know that a few more days later, he was at, on the bench against North Alabama. We know a few more days later, he was on the bench against Villanova. K-State wins the game. He goes over in the student section. He's doing the Wabash. Um, and then we know less than 24 hours later, he's off the team. So it's unlikely that between Villanova and Wednesday night, new information came into the hands of the president of this university um, to make this decision. I think we also can kind of know that the president made th this decision because he made the statement on Friday that he didn't have to make. Um, yeah. Gene Taylor made the, the statement. I think most people implied that he probably didn't want to, but he had to. But regardless, he made the statement. And then you have your basketball coach come out and say, hey, let's move forward. Let's love each other. Let's love this university. Let's, let's make this work. He didn't need to mention Gene Taylor. He didn't need to mention uh, President Linton. He just – let's said let's move on that should have been enough you're right i think people were calmed down enough at that point that people were ready to move forward at least for the time being and let see what happens over the next few days few weeks that i, I don't know I, I just don't understand who in the pr department at k-state um, or the lawyers or whoever when when that statement was written would have advised hey go ahead with this 
this makes a lot of sense. You're going to calm people down with this. Like no good lawyer or PR person is going to look at that letter and, and say, look, you talk about FERPA and Title IX and we can't say anything, but then you mention the kid's name in the letter. Yeah. Like that makes zero sense. Like that's just not logical that that's the path you would go down in that situation. So um, at minimum, there was a massive failure of communication between uh, the administration, president's office, the AD, the basketball staff for it to come to this point. Otherwise, the basketball staff wouldn't allow Naquan Tomlin back on the bench. Like, yeah, maybe, maybe not. They, maybe they, who knows what, if they thought there was a path, maybe they were just going to wait it out and let him graduate and then let him move on. But regardless to have to get to that point where a statement was made um, that he's off the team um, was, was unnecessary. And then even more unnecessary to make the statement that president Littman, Littman made on Friday, which didn't do anything for anybody. Didn't clarify anything, just muddied the water even worse and made the PR even worse, especially after I think coach Tang had a great message on Thursday yeah. night. Well, and I'll let Drew go here in a second, but let, let me throw this in here. If the thought process that some people have thrown out there is, Hey, you know, and these are the people that I think are trying to be more measured and they aren't wanting yeah. to join the crowd that want to just dump on Richard Linton and, and make him be like public enemy number one um, that say, Hey, maybe there was an agreement here between Jerome Tang, Gene Taylor and president Linton that he will be with us. We'll get him to graduation week. And then, you know, he, he can be cut loose from there, but we want to be able to support him, get him through school. Then he can do his own thing. Here's the one thing that I would push back on that. Then you don't need to come out and say you're kicking him off the team yeah. and do all of this because you have that conversation and just say, hey, look, Naquan, this suspension, it's going to be a permanent thing. It's going to last throughout the year. We love you. We support you. You can continue to be with the team. We're going to give you, you know, our resources and everything. But because of a lot of different details going on, we can't let you play in another game. And you know what Naquan Tomlin does? He graduates and goes to the transfer portal. You don't need to kick him off for that to be the case. Mm -hmm. And so I, I appreciate what people are doing when they suggest that. Like, hey, maybe this was a get him to graduation, then he, he can go on. You don't have to do this whole kick him off thing. Like, you can just say, hey, Naquan Tomlin is no longer with the basketball team or let him enter the portal. And you avoid all this. So that I don't think that is realistically something that happened here. I think it, this is a something went down where, you know, some feelings got hurt and a lot of other things happened and Richard Linton stepped in and he said, look, I'm, I'm staying in my position and I'm the number one at this university. I don't care what kind of money athletics brings in and all this other stuff. We're going to do what I say. Uh, and, and you guys are going to deal with the repercussions if you're not with me. And obviously it would seem that Jerome Tang and Gene Taylor were not with him by all indications. And they ultimately lost out because he's got final say so, because He's the person that uh, some some higher ups throughout the state decided was fit to run Kansas State University, and I imagine that a lot of alums like myself are seriously questioning if he has that ability to do right now. Yeah, I mean, just from a strictly PR uh, perspective, it's just a disaster class in what not to do. I mean. There, like Fan and Mason, you've said there's nothing that possibly could have happened in the 20 hours from Tomlin wabashing in the student section to being kicked off the team. And I think the other thing that is going to bother a lot of people is that now with Nicole and Tomlin in the transfer portal, and he's eligible to play right away because he hasn't played in a game yet. And won't you know it? you know, somehow, some way, he's going to end up on a team that could potentially play K-State. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest with you real quick. Uh, you guys can feel different, and people can bash me in, in the comments and wherever for, for saying this, um, but I had to take my dad and brother to the airport yesterday morning, and we, we all seem to be in agreement. I think at this stage, I'd love nothing more than Naquan Tomlin to end up at KU and drop 35 on K-State and, and <laughs> beat him this year. And that – that sucks because I like Jerome Tang. I obviously love the school that I went to. As I tell people, it is a whole heck of a lot easier and more fun to do this job when K-State's winning because uh, I love and appreciate all of you guys that, that help us do what we do. But 
you're quite insufferable to deal with uh, after losses. And I just I, I want to see K-State get spurned real bad by this Naquan Tomlin thing uh, because of how Richard Linton handled it. Because it just it's not it's not fair at the very least. Maybe again, maybe this is the fair outcome to Naquan Tomlin. We don't know. But I will also say I know the character of Gene Taylor and Jerome Tang from how they've handled themselves at K-State and how they've treated people. Those are two guys that I trust if they think Naquan Tomlin should be allowed to come back and play at K-State or at the very least be with this team, then he should probably be afforded that opportunity because those are not guys that are going to put winning over serious stuff that puts other people at the school at risk or the school at large at risk. And the fact that we already know that there are a bunch of teams out there that are going to line up to get Naquan Tomlin – Look, the K State is not better than any other school in, in this land in terms of where they stand and how they handle themselves. If Naquan Tomlin can play somewhere else, he certainly could be playing at K State. So uh, I would just throw that out there. But Drew, you can take back over. I was just saying, like, I, I just think that that's what sucks about it the most is that you know that he's going to be eligible to play right away. So it makes you just wonder, like, what what possibly has gone down, and it just makes you think about a lot of things and I just go back to just strictly from a PR perspective again it just none of this makes sense of why he can be on the bench yeah at one point and 20 hours later he's gone yeah it, 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 I just it, I struggled to wrap my head around this and I mean I, I don't know how you guys felt but it felt like Wednesday was the the day that never ended because uh, yeah. it, Wednesday it, was it, the worst it started yeah. it started with Con Klein at the protests, then had the statement by Gene Taylor. Like Wednesday was the day that never ended. Yeah, I, and I think ultimately, you know, Mason and Drew, you both mentioned Gene Taylor. Like he's really it, to me, he's the one getting thrown under the bus. Because it would it would seem to me it would be Linton, then Taylor, then Tang. Mm-hmm. Taylor's mm-hmm. Taylor's been an AD since two thousand one. He's been at K State six and a half years. Um he was at Iowa before that, North Dakota State before that. When in his career has there ever been anything that touched on anything that looked like doing winning at all costs? Yes. That has never been part of Gene Taylor's character. It's never been part of it for sure at K-State. And I don't think it was at Iowa. I don't think it was North Dakota State. And so it ultimately, as a president of the university, you have to trust your AD and know the track record of, of this man. Gene Taylor has been nothing but – uh, a man of integrity and in doing his job as an athletic director in his whole career, whether it be a full athletic director like he was at K-State and North Dakota State or uh, an assistant athletic director at Iowa. He's done his job. He's done his job well. And ultimately, you are making this man look bad, intentionally or not. That's what you're doing is you're saying he's not doing his job. And that's the wrong thing to do because there's no evidence that that's the case. And there have, hasn't been in a 20 plus year career for this guy. So, so to me, I feel the worst for Gene Taylor. I mean, Tang, Tang's got to deal with it with his team and with, with the player, but Gene Taylor, this is a knock on his career, whether it's meant to be or not, that's what it comes down as. And and that's, that's just the, that's the most wrong part to me is Gene Taylor has been a great AD and has been a man of character and, and he should not be in this, this position at all. Your, your role as a university president, when you have an athletic director, especially one as seasoned and as smart as Gene Taylor, is let him make the decisions for athletics. You can be advised, you can give your input, but at the end of the day, as the president, I think your role should be to be a, a supporter if you have the right guy in place. And K-State has the right guy in place in Gene Taylor. We know that. He has been mm-hmm. successful in a lot of ways he has raised money for projects at k-state and he has hired the some of the best and most influential coaches that this school is going to have in in a situation where that seems like it would be really tough to do considering you just had bill snyder here and he basically built manhattan and how are you going to find a way to make hires that rival that well you hired a guy in chris kleiman that has made sure that football didn't fall off the map and is back to being a Big 12 champion caliber program. And then you hired a guy in Jerome Tang that 
who, who knows what the ultimate outcome ends up being, but he could take K-State basketball to heights that they've never been to before and get them back to a Final Four or something of the likes. You should not be stepping in, especially when you have much less time at this school than Gene Taylor does. Gene Taylor has been here long enough. He knows what K-State's about, and he's not going to do anything to jeopardize K-State athletics or the school at large because he's been here long enough, and he's likely to end his his career here. He's not going to screw up a place that he is just as much a part of now as the three of us who went to K-State are. Gene Taylor is one of us. He understands what he needs to do. And if the decision was Naquan Tomlin needs to not be on this basketball team, then I have no doubt that he would have made that decision. But all indications are this was not his call. He had to wear it for President Linton. And when people were still upset and it didn't seem to be satisfactory with everybody, then the president finally had to crawl out of his cave, his digital cave, and post a statement somewhere. Um, this is just, I don't know. This is, it's a terrible and not very fun conversation to have, but you know, it's, it's important. We got to talk about it. And I'm sure a majority of K-State fans feel the same way as us right now. And I, I I don't know where else to, to go with it on that. Do you have any final thoughts, Drew? Uh, so we can move off this negative topic. Uh, I mean, my, my final thought, I guess would be, you said it would be funny if he goes to KU and drops 35 on K-State. I think the funniest part of him going to KU would be the KU burner accounts that keep making up rumors about the whole fight situation, having to walk all of that back <laughs> if he commits to KU. True. I actually, the funnier outcome might be that he goes to Baylor and that Jerome Tang just hooks up Scott Drew. Uh, that would be very funny as well. My, that might be funnier, and that might be a loss that people can stomach a little bit more if Naquan has 35 in a Baylor uniform as opposed to KU. So I'll, I'll change my attitude. I want Naquan Tomlin, even if it's not realistic, to go to Baylor and score 35 against K-State. Um, so that's uh, where I stand on that. But not a fun not a fun week for the most part outside of the on-court stuff uh, for K-State basketball. So before we go, uh, any final thoughts from the week or shout-outs that you guys uh, want to give out to anybody right now? Uh, I mean, you you mentioned it uh, in the overshadowing. I'll, I'll give the K-State women's basketball team a shout-out. They dismantled a pretty decent Missouri team yesterday. And, I mean, it, <laughs> we can wake up tomorrow and they might be in the top 10, which I, I know that I we all kind of expected that they would be pretty good, but they've really taken a jump, I think. And it, it's pretty evident when you watch them that they're, they're not a, like, painful team to watch on offense anymore like the the offense is pretty free flowing they're hitting jump shots and then the defense is uh one of the top in the country as well yeah they're actually shooting above 30 percent from three this season uh which if they if they do that by the end of the year uh, this would be the first time since uh the 2020-21 season that they did that because in uh the last four seasons K-State has only had one occurrence where they've shot better than 29% from three, uh, which just, it pains me as a guy that the the way that I define you as a basketball player is if you can make the three, but they have found ways around that to be successful and look good. And obviously their defense has been a big topic of conversation, especially whether you know it or not. I know a lot of people were wondering what the heck is Bill Snyder doing with a stuffed goat uh, over the weekend? Uh that's that's another thing that I think makes this team very endearing is that that's just a funny thing to have is the gap goat as they call it. So if you haven't read up on that and understand it, uh, go out and do so. So yeah, I, the K State women's basketball team definitely deserves uh, a, a big you know a, appreciation for how they've played this season and also this week for taking care of business like they did uh, against Missouri. My, my shout out goes to what I did not expect to be the best will on the court against LSU. Will McNair has, has been number one, just a pleasant surprise overall. I did not know what we were getting with him. Um, it's been a long time since we've had a post player at K-State that can catch the ball near the basket, make a move and go score consistently around the rim. Will McNair is that guy. I think he had arguably his best game as a cat, 13 points, uh, five rebounds, three block shots in 28 minutes, 1.5 efficiency. 
really solid game for Will Dare. And more importantly, defending Will Baker, who I think is a really good player. I remember him at Texas. He was a, a, f- a five-star ca- guy at Texas. We played him last year at Nevada. He scored, I think, 19 points against us at Nevada last year in the Cayman Island tournament. And Will McNair did a great job defensively against Will Baker. Yeah, but he, also, but also he, scored the ball and has been a pleasant surprise. He's responded to being benched against North Alabama, and has played well. Um, he's kind of had an up and down, uh, kind of in the media relationship with Jerome Tang, and I think you know we're seeing what could be a pretty good piece in the post for K State this year in Will McNair. So I, I'm going to give him my shout out this week. Don't forget, he's two for two on solo fast breaks this season. That's true. That's true. A dunk and a layup. Uh, is is Will Baker the first player to ever face K State in three different uniforms? That, that I think that's probably true. I would guess he has to be. That's pretty impressive. Uh, I mean, like Tyrese Hunter has obviously done it in two. Uh, we yep. know that's probably the most recent example of that. Um, it's just uh, kind of a weird thing to to think about. That's. Kind of like uh, you think about next season, it's going to be weird uh, for for K State facing Tulane, where in the last two seasons they will have faced Tulane, and then they will have faced Sumrall, and now they will be facing Tulane and Sumrall together. Uh, so they've seen what they need to see from both sides of that uh, for football next season. But the Will Baker thing is kind of fascinating on how that ends up working out. The the ties to to facing K State that he has. Uh, look, I, I think Will McNair has given more to K State this season already than I expected him to give at all this year. I thought, you know, not really the flashiest addition to the team. It, it, it's good to have depth. Maybe he'll ha- he'll do a few thing here or there. But he's a legit player for him right now, and he's coming through and, and doing a lot of good things. So uh, good on Will McNair for how that's played out. But uh, that will do it here. I mean, just you we end no- this with lunacy. I mean. How stupid do you have to be if you're the Cowboys? That was the most blatantly obvious <laughs> fake punt that was coming and just wide open. I mean, ridiculous. You you uh, have no shout outs this week? You, you're, you're just, you're going to be, you're, you're calm. Well, I kind of, I kind of set the stage for you with the, the, the women's basketball team and yeah. everything. I'll give a shout out to Arthur Kaluma for continuing to shred Villanova. Uh, he's go. played True. three straight games against Villanova where he's just completely dogged them so uh, i will give arthur kaluma a shout out in that regard and i'll also give a shout out to gene taylor and jerome tang because i think those two guys uh ha- they need a lot of love and support right now for what they've gone through this week and what they've done for k-state in the entirety of their careers but it needs to be paid back to them right now because obviously tang is dealing with this entire mess and so is gene taylor but then on top of that Gene probably is is feeling the heat and some nervousness about his football situation when you lose Colin Klein and in the NIL world and everything else you're worried about. Man, we, we felt set up now. We've got you know to worry about keeping Avery Johnson. There's a lot going on for those guys right now, uh, and they've been such big time ballers for K State that uh, they they need all the support and everything they're owed to come to them this week. So uh, shout out to them for putting up with everything. And being being just good humans in the process, and you know, Gene Taylor, I like it's close to the point where I would say I would be on edge if I were him, and I'd be tempted to just insubordinate, go over Linton's head, and say, "Look, here's the deal: this is not my decision." And all these other things, um, he has not done that. And Jerome Tang, obviously, putting out the video to try and get everybody to calm down. Um, those are just two awesome dudes that K State's fortunate to have working for them and, and trying to make K-State a better place right now. So props to Gene Taylor and Jerome Tang for everything that they've had to deal with this week and will probably have to deal with for the foreseeable future. So, all right, that will do it for this edition of the KSO Show. This crew will be back next weekend. We will have a basketball game against Nebraska. Um, I don't know what you guys have going on next week, but we may just do this in Bramlage after the game. Uh, it might be a quicker show than usual, but it might just be easier to take care of it all then as opposed to a normal instant reaction video. Uh, and then we will reconvene at some point. We'll talk more football in the near future as well as the Pop-Tarts Bowl 
gets closer for K-State. And then D.Y. and I will be here all throughout the week. Obviously, if there's breaking news, which there was constantly this past week, we'll have <laughs> videos as it calls for. Uh, but we'll have a couple of podcasts throughout the week for everybody just to get some uh, notable information. We might take tomorrow off, just considering this is coming out Sunday night into Monday morning for everybody. But stay tuned. Stay locked in with everything on the KSO YouTube page. And then for sure, head over to kstateonline.com with on three, and that's uh, your best spot to stay up to date with K-State information. So for K-State uh, Online, I am Mason Vote. That's KSU underscore fan and Drew Galloway. We are back next week, D.Y. and I, throughout the week. Lots of great cat coverage. And uh, we will talk to you all sometime soon, and I'm sure I'll have more nasty things to say about Wichita State. <laughs>